welcome to EPG Patshala. This is Dr. Neelakshi Roy from VG Vaze College, Mulund, Mumbai. And this module is about the issues of race and multiculturalism. There are two objectives in this module. One objective is to acquaint the learner with the historical process of early migration vis-a-vis -vis race, class and gender. And the second objective is to discuss how migration has taken place in the 20th century and the kinds of processes of globalization at work which have dislocated many populations from India to different countries and continents. What we will be also looking at are the underpinnings of this kind of migration in relation to the development of multicultural policies across these new spaces. All the new countries which have undergone massive migration from India have been finding it very difficult to deal with large masses of population. We must also remember that there are many other masses of immigrants from other countries. Thus, new laws are made every day, multicultural policies are practiced and the countries try their best to accommodate many, many different kinds of people all at once suddenly in the latter part of the 20th century and now of course in the 21st. Race and racism are terms centered around the ideas of discrimination among people of different skin color, ethnicity and place of origin. Physical attributes were always the obvious basis for discrimination among people of different origins. But there is no substantial agreement between countries and policy makers about what is the proper definition of racism. But any discriminatory practice that nationals of one country or citizens of one group perpetrate or face as opposed to others on the basis of different origins and attributes is termed a racist practice. Racism is one of the most pernicious of evils dividing human beings. Fear of miscegenation or mixing of the races through breeding is one of the most feared among problems associated with race and racism. There is another problem associated with this fear, that of the implicit superiority of the Caucasian races in terms of their whiteness. Together, these two problems have always compounded into bitter race relations in the world over. Fear of miscegenation is primarily due to the skin color of offspring being different from that of the parent. It is believed that the color of skin indicates racial purity or affinity and a departure from that is a kind of betrayal to the notion of tribe, community, nation, etc. So, the greatest fear is of the intermingling of races by marriage. Racist practices are primarily targeted at keeping communities, especially men and women, apart from each other. In the past, physical differences were also attempted to be correlated by scientists to mental and intellectual and psychological difference. The white colonial masters started this trend to keep indigenous communities separate and at bay. Thus arose the notion of the superior class which is strong, rational, active and intelligent and therefore fit to rule over the inferior class of native. White skin indicated racial purity or affinity and dark skin showed inferiority. European colonization is a fairly recent phenomenon which has taken this racism to a great extent but there have been other waves of colonization from ancient times as well and race conflicts have always been a part of these. It is arguable whether casteism is synonymous with racism and the debate on this has not yet been resolved. However, in very recent times the Indian diaspora has been facing race related issues in a large number in a variety of global locations as well. As you have been studying in this course, Indians are found in many many locations outside of India abroad as a distinct ethnic community. A number of historical circumstances have resulted in widespread forced as well as voluntary migration of groups from India to several locations abroad. There have been people from the subcontinent in Southeast Asia from much longer and in Africa and the Caribbean and in the Asia Pacific as well. The subcontinental presence in these spaces in the early times has been affected by questions of class and gender along with the problems of migration. The history of subcontinental migration has three phases. The first phase was pre-colonial that is until the 
18th century. The second phase of periodization is colonial 19th and early 20th centuries. And the third phase, the post-independence phase, when the Indian sought better opportunities in the West happened during the globalization period. This last phase is the phase when the Indian community was identifiable in public spaces and services abroad. The spurt of immigration in the 1980s is a result direct almost from the tremendous upsurge of human and financial mobility brought in by globalized capital. Recent trends show that there are many Indians going for academic reasons for better jobs, especially in the Gulf and for careers in IT to the US, Canada, UK, Australia, Singapore and the Southeast of Asia. Later in this video, you will have references to how Indians deal with new kinds of policies related to multiculturalism in these societies. Racism towards Indians can be looked at region wise, that is according to host countries as well as chronologically. In the colonial period, some Indians went to England where they experienced racism from the white population on account of their being considered dark, native, inferior people. Indians also migrated as indentured labour to British and to a small extent French colonies and here the dynamics was more complex. Here too, they were subjected to racist treatment, but there was some difference made between the Indian immigrants and the native people by the colonizers. Sometimes to Indian advantage, they were considered somehow as slightly superior to the indigenous population. In addition, Indian migrants themselves generally kept a social distance from the indigenous people and this could be interpreted as Indians themselves practicing racism. When these countries got independence from colonial rule, they often singled out the immigrant Indians for discriminatory treatment for a variety of reasons. So, this is another example of racism. The 20th century migrations to the West have been associated with varying degrees and kinds of racism, but also with tolerance, acceptance and recognition, as well as the evolution of a policy of multiculturalism, though of course it is definitely a problematized site. The data for racism towards pre-colonial Indians is very sparse. Some glimpses of Indians in England can be had from books where pre-colonial and colonial periods mingle and merge. One of the most useful and interesting publications for this is Ayas, Laskars and Princes. It reveals a strong Indian presence in the underbelly of English life in the period between 1700 to 1947. Many Indians in England were from the working classes. They were travelling semi-professionals, traders, skilled craftsmen, skilled labourers, entertainers, others who travelled as sailors and ship hands and laskers. There were even servants, cooks, nurses or ayahs, dancers, performers or gentus, magicians, masseurs and quacks who gained notoriety in the upper classes with their secret remedies for hidden ailments like the shampoo doctor Sheikh Deen Mohammed. You can see his picture and even a sort of a slack on the place where he stayed in the city of Westminster in the Portman estate. Sheikh Deen Mohammed, shampoo surgeon, is credited to be the first English author from India and his book The Travels of Deen Mohammed was published in 1794. Michael H. Fisher 1997 writes about Sheikh Deen Mohammed and his life in Britain after he marries a woman and has children by her. He shows how the shampoo surgeon remained ignored and marginalized by British mainstream society in Bristol, which benefited largely from the excellent commercial success of his art, that is the art of shampooing or offering chumpy or hair massage. Yet, the city of Bristol gave him no place in the city offices, though he was a law-abiding and decent citizen as well. His contribution to the very brisk trade and commerce in Bristol and the development of Bristol as a tourist spot is definitely undermined. Fisher records how very little information is available on Deen Mohammed's Irish wife Jane and how spouses and the children of the Indo-British marriages like his were 
actually the butt of ridicule and contempt in British society then. No records are there to show this. In the 19th century, students from upper classes also migrated. There were definitely many groups who faced racism in different degrees among these students. There were also women who accompanied their white and Indian mistresses as servants and slaves, as ayahs or nurses to Africa and Europe. Some of these women have remained ignored and have not been able to record any of their life's histories because they were illiterate. However, some upper class families have migrated to Britain in order to be able to fully imbibe Western influence. Again, these women and families also experienced racist reactions, but they were able to record these reactions. Young women who travelled there with their husbands or families like Hemangini Banerjee and her daughters who first went to England in 1864 or the poet Toru Dutt and her sisters who were in England between 1871 and 1873 were received well as they were from the upper classes, but their uneducated mothers were isolated like Hemangini Banerjee was. Anandi Bai Zoshi, Cornelia Sorabji and Sarojini Naidu were some of the very well educated women who emigrated abroad only for studying and for furthering their careers. The latter were very well received in the UK, but Anandi Bai Joshi suffered greatly on her journey home from the US while she was suffering from tuberculosis. She was not looked after by a doctor or attended by nurses during her journey due to her race and after her arrival in India because she had travelled abroad and lost her racial purity. As Pooja Thakkar writes in her book about Anandibai Joshi that the journey back home took a further toll on Anandibai and she died soon after reaching India. However, other than the female students, there were also male student migrants from India and the Caribbean in the UK. All of these peoples faced racism in their daily interaction with the host communities and some of the best records are kept by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi in his My Experiments with Truth. Other than England, the Caribbean, Mauritius, Fiji, Malaysia, Guyana, were some of the other places where the Indians faced several types of racist persecution as indentured labourers or girmitia, that is those who made agreements with the government or agents to work abroad for a definite period of time. That agreement was called as the girmit. Vinay Lal, Vijay Mishra and Bridge K. Lal discuss these in their writings extensively. The Caribbean Indians first. Let us talk about how the Caribbean Indians first arrived in Trinidad abroad the Fatal Rosak on 30th May 1845 to provide the sugar plantations with a large and cheap labour force. Many of them were engaged in agriculture but over the next few decades they began to make their presence felt as professionals and entrepreneurs. Later, as in the rest of the Caribbeans, the Afro-Trinidadians and Indo-Trinidadians had increasing interracial divisions till it all culminated in unmistakably clear discrimination against the latter in job quotas, discriminatory Africanization of history, of endeavours to represent Trinidad as a country of exclusively or predominantly African origins. In other words, these processes of Africanization totally ignored and undermined the positions of the Indian populations who brought in so much of cheap labour and the success of the sugar plantations because of their labour and because of their organising skills. The first immigrant ship, as I said, arrived in 1845, after a journey of five months carrying 225 Indians, mostly in their 20s, and over eight men for every woman. Some of the oral narratives of the Indo Caribbean women and men in Mauritius who went from UP and Bihar in the late 19th and early 20th century are being uncovered from wedding songs, songs sung during Ram Leela and other cultural discourses. It may be interesting to read two pieces of fiction, it may be interesting to read two books of fiction, Ramabai Espinet's The Swinging Bridge and Amitav Ghosh's The Sea of Poppies for an account of their journeys 
and the life in their new homes. Indians were first brought to Fiji in 1879 to work as indentured labourers on sugar plantations owned primarily by the colonial sugar factories. One of them was called the Colonial Sugar Refining Company of Australia. There was a lot of violence perpetrated on Indian indentured labourers, but they did enjoy some measure of freedom from the stronghold of caste and oppression against women back in India. There was no protection available to them against inhuman labour conditions. And though through their hard work, the states of Queensland and New South Wales were developed, the Fijian Indians were systematically excluded from political representation by the ethnic Malinese and the white majority both. Till the 1990s when Mahendra Chaudhary formed the government in Fiji, Indians had to fight for ownership of the land they tilled against repatriation moves, against no voting rights, unjust citizenship laws and forced migration to other locations. Even today, these problems continue in Fiji. Now to move to Australia. In Australia, the Ghan Express is a route that brought Afghan camel trainers by the thousands between 1860 to 1930s on contract for three-year periods. It was named after the travelling migrants believed to have come from Afghanistan diminished to Ghan. You can see the picture of the Ghan Express in the visual. The Ghan Express started in 2004 and the original camel route is followed even now. The Ghan train was named for the pioneering cameliers. Many of these pioneers stayed back and were the first Indians to work there as labourers. Later, Punjabi Sikhs joined them. They never went back and were the first migrants from India. Australians were now afraid of more influx from India. The government had always institutionalized separation of white and non-white communities. They forbade intermarriage for fear of miscegenation and perpetrated racist attacks on non-whites. Even under such conditions, in the post-colonial phase, many Indians migrated. At first, especially railway workers, dock workers from the Anglo-Indian community and then professionals and students who stayed on to build their careers. A number of repatriation moves from Fiji, Malaysia and Africa brought new Indian populations to Australia and the trend continues till today with the IT and other professionals from India. Newspapers, TV and radio stations, restaurants, cultural programs and Indian and Indo-Fijian association activities abound in Australia and they make representations from time to time for citizenship, visa, remittance and other assistance as Vinay Lal in the report on Indian diaspora shows. The migration of Indian farm labourers to South Africa started in 1860 to farm the sugar plantations. As in other countries of the Indian indenture diaspora, Indians played a role in other arenas of agricultural production. There were also by this time a considerable presence of sojourning Indians, traders, teachers, doctors and clerks. The history of the Indian diaspora in South Africa is distinct from the Indian indenture diaspora. Indians performed in farming, and other arenas of agricultural production and in other professional arenas as well. But in South Africa, the ideology of racial segregation was institutionalized and brutally enforced, first under British colonialism and then under apartheid. Mahatma Gandhi's own political and moral conscientization and the later role he played in the Indian freedom movement owe their origin and force to the racism he experienced here from the whites in South Africa. Gandhi's interventions in the late 19th and first decade of the 20th century, especially his passive resistance, not only mobilized the Indians in South Africa against racism, but played an important role in inspiring several African leaders in their struggle in the 20th century against apartheid. Both before and after the apartheid movement, there were many generations of Indians in Africa who lived in abject conditions. Even after the ANC came to power, this continues. Though many Indians have been well rewarded politically for their support during the struggle against apartheid, black animosity has increasingly turned towards Indians. With the Kwa Zulu writer and musician Momgeni Ngema releasing a song entitled Amandia, there started a new wave of racial hatred and violent crimes against Indians. The nature of racism faced by Indians in East Africa under Idi Amin started in South Africa. Indian indentured labour in Malaysia originated in the late 19th century and the vast bulk of the labourers 
of the rubber plantations were drawn from Tamil Nadu. Nearly a lakh of Indians were brought to Malaysia each year in the early decades of the 20th century. The Indian population became preponderant in the coastal areas and they are largely found around the plantations. There are numerous indices pointing to widespread poverty among Indians in Malaysia. Indians control very little of the country's finances and are the most poorly housed, educated and cared for community, almost as poor as the Malays. They are constantly the community that has many criminals, drug and alcohol addicts and receives very poor health care. Religious discrimination of the Tamilian Hindus, the largest Indian group of the Indian diaspora, is rampant at an institutionalized level. Even though the conflict at a service level is about religion and ethnicity, the racial element is present as an undertow. The Hindraf, Hindu Religious Action Force, is an activist group that has been formed to resist targeting and fighting legal battles for Hindu minorities. Their reception as a terrorist group is of course a very normal reaction to such organizations which fight for civil rights by authorities in any country. The 20th century migrations to the West happened due to several factors about which you have read in the preceding modules. These and the Indian origin asylum seekers from Tanzania and Uganda were also new additions to the Asian population in Canada, Australia, England and America after the mid 20th century. Migration to the Gulf became a big phenomenon from the 1970s and 80s due to the oil boom and demand for labor there. There are numerous studies that document the difficult conditions for Indian labor in the Gulf. Vinay Lal's writings are eloquent on the subject. There are the Gulf migrants who are not even allowed to surface in the public places, leave alone participate in public life. Labor law violations are rampant, withholding of wages for several months, lack of health care facilities, absence of safety regulations, illegal confiscation of passport and lack of freedom of movement are the sure fate of these workers in Dubai, the richest country in the world. Deaths and injuries of workers on construction sites are hidden. Sexual exploitation is rampant. Unions are banned. Although at one level these can be seen as conflicts between labor and capital, the underlying policies of discrimination towards non-Arabs and non-Muslims brings in a racial dimension to the interaction. As Vinay Lal says, if the diaspora is about success, it also offers narratives of oppression, hardship and resistance. Globalization in the late 1980s brought new compulsions in race relations. These are new waves of culture and they definitely permeated the host countries. The migrant communities could not be ignored anymore as they were people from countries with whom the host had trade agreements of large scale and therefore there were many consequences. Thus the new era of multicultural policy emerged. This ideally stood for a harmonious existence of all communities and races and ethnic groups, each recognized for its cultural distinctiveness as well as integration in the host society. But at a deeper level, so goes the criticism, there is exoticization over, of some over others and a kind of consumerist approach to culture. In the world of fashion, Madonna's embracing of the exotica of Asian culture, the tattoos, the mehendi, the bangles, the bindi worn with lycra or jeans and tank tops brought unprecedented popularity to Asian cool, not only to Britain but to the international culture scene. New cuisines from Asia, China, Mexico, Turkey, Lebanon, flooded the eat streets of Europe. The blandness of European food was easily replaced by the subtle Chinese or the spicy Indian cuisine. Chicken tikka masala has today become the national favorite of the UK. Whereas the Middle Eastern donor kebab is the favorite street food of Germany, which hosts so many Turkish immigrants. However, in these societies at one level, there is eager consumption of exotica, Yet, not many years ago, there had happened the famous dot buster movements of New Jersey, the petrol bombs in the UK, the burning of the long hair of Sikh children, calling them towel heads and the setting of fire to dupattas. Thus, diaspora Indians are very cautious of celebratory approaches and tokenisms shown by these societies from time to time. 
New policies in relation to multiculturalism have emerged, wherein public celebration of festivals was introduced. However, other laws were enforced which made the ethnic communities follow more mainstream practices like the use of or competence in English or the host language. The term ethnicity was more easily attached to the European migrations which started around the two world wars. In North America, phrases such as visible minorities were developed to categorize non-European immigrants who formed part of new diasporas and neatly encapsulated as well the indigenous groups and those descendants of African slaves who had been an uneasily unacknowledged part of the nation for many centuries. Hence, multiculturalism is often perceived as a covert means of indicating racialized differences. The need to deconstruct the natural facade of racialization is clear when one notes that groups such as Ukrainians in Canada and Greeks and Italians in Australia were designated black at various historical stages. Further difficulties encountered by the indigenous group are highlighted in Australia where the Aborigines refused to be included in multicultural discourses on the grounds that these refer only to cultures of migration, whereas in New Zealand, biculturalism is the preferred official term because multiculturalism is seen as a diversion from the Maori sovereignty movement. In Canada, First Nations are occasionally included in multicultural discourses and practices and are also consistently trapped between the French-English divide. This has complicated continuing debates on cultural appropriation. The countries practicing multicultural policies were Canada, USA and Britain, soon to be followed by France, Germany, Australia and other European countries like Netherlands and now Sweden. The idea was to make people feel that officially the country was welcoming them, respecting their culture, but they need to integrate willingly to stay happy and feel welcome. Of course, voluntary and successful integration is the ideal. People who learn the language get the jobs, unquote, as Charles Taylor says in an interview to Prospect magazine. Lord Bhikkhu Parekh puts forth the idea of Britishness as a plural identity that celebrates difference. However, Britain has recently experienced a wave of responses from multicultural communities themselves. These communities argue against the increasing stringency of immigration controls and the introduction of citizenship tests and ceremonies which do not celebrate difference. Instead, they segregate and differentiate according to racial profiles. Many would agree that there is overall a paradigm shift in British political discourse from multiculturalism to social cohesion or from celebrating difference to affirming shared values. Differences in policies in the various countries were quite major. Canada practiced the cultural mosaic idea in which communities maintained their differences yet stood together as Canadians. USA insisted on the melting pot culture where differences were to be subsumed under a pan-American ideal and Britain where separatist ethnicization was another name for multiculturalism. Charles Taylor says and I quote, Canadian multiculturalism was always strongly integrative. The famous White Paper of 1969 had four aims. One was to break down cultural barriers. Another was to make sure newcomers learned one of the two languages. He adds how it had a very strong notion of liberal integration where immigrants were looked upon as guest workers at first and there was no idea what to do with them when they began to stay. In the earlier group of host countries, there are new bodies of peoples entering and settling. The US is full of illegal immigrants from Mexico and Cuba and the UK, East European, especially Polish, Croatian and Serbian immigrants abound. Canada, New Zealand and Australia are seen as more white countries. So, there are many younger people from the mainstream relocating there from the erstwhile empire especially from the UK. In Europe, especially in Germany, Sweden and France, there are many new groups of migrants entering every day as exiles, asylum seekers and as illegal migrants. Traveling with no passports, papers, passes, entering the country as stowaways in the most harrowing conditions, some even die or fall ill out of the exhaustion of the journey. Those who survive tell their tales and films have been made on their journeys by people like Fatih Akin, Ken Loach, Danny Boyle, Meera Nair, Deepa Mehta and several documentary filmmakers. Some of these stories are really gruesome but they are not always necessarily about Indian immigrants. Even Bollywood has repeatedly turned its gaze outward to the diaspora by making films on them. Overall, multiculturalism as a philosophical concept and as a policy is seen as both a solution 
and a problem? On the one hand, it is praised for professing equality and social recognition and on the other hand, it is criticized for creating more inequality and social fragmentation. The position of Indians in the diaspora has always been precarious. Though they are a majority population in many spaces, they are treated as minority. Though they are economically successful, their socialization and host national identity are questioned. In a number of countries like Africa, Fiji and Malaysia, Indians were sacrificed to nationalist policies. One of the unalterable truths of multicultural societies in which Indians are found is a dichotomous one. Their religious beliefs, diligence, food habits and gregarious identity are very distinct and have always attracted admiration and curiosity from their hosts. But these very characteristics have also created distances, suspicion and hatred among them and the host communities. Indians themselves also practice exclusivity. They prefer not to socialize at work, not to share food from the host, stay away from active politics, play minimal social roles. Though in terms of entrepreneurship, education and the professions, they are very participative and contribute their best. Indians are often also illegal migrants. They face innumerable problems as in Dubai and the Gulf. Moreover, religion, especially Hindu fundamentalism, is raising its head everywhere. The recent visit of the Indian Prime Minister to the USA has had many Hindu radical associations reaching out to more people in the diaspora than before. Indians abroad are still politically insulated. They hardly perform their political duties but demand rights in the host country. The stages these Indian migrant populations followed were those of integration and assimilation in the 1960s and 70s and were finally co-opted into the project of multiculturalism from the 80s and 90s. They tried to integrate as if by holding on to some aspects of their own culture and tried to melt in into the new cultural environment. Later, they attempted assimilation by abandoning their own cultural habits and values in order to accept the new country totally to be accepted as a part of the majority culture. In the later phases, despite the project of multiculturalism which exoticized the outsider communities, many Indian communities practiced separation by avoiding contact with the majority culture as much as they could. However, new global communities of Indians may be said to practice marginalization, a strategy by which they neither practice their original cultural traditions nor integrate in the new culture, thereby living in a kind of non-identity. The future is complicated. Indian governments cannot be expected to look after the illegal migrants. Militant Hinduism is not reducing poverty or solving issues of citizenship. Political participation of diasporic Indians must be made stronger and less exclusive. The groups and generations of migrated Indians have been victims of racism in different countries, yet they have made continual attempts to integrate or assimilate. They have been rewarded for their tendency to be economically successful and integrated, but they have been socially and maritally aloof. The post-globalization trend of multiculturalism has had its mixed consequences. Indians are prized for their ethnicity in many ways and they lend themselves to it. Yet, the world is a global village today, so they carry little Indias with them wherever they go, thus remaining virtually back home and thus participating little or not at all in the host country's politics or societal dynamics. The contribution of women to the Indian diaspora and especially to the new immigrant success of the communities is not to be undermined. The visuals show you some of these examples. Along with the men who travelled by the roads, there were many women who travelled to many distant locations and took up professions which they never before would have thought of back in their homeland. Thus, the contribution of the women can in no way be undermined. Especially, one can remember the contribution of the wealthy princess from the Ranjit Singh Ji family, Sophia Duleep Singh, who donated much of her wealth to the suffragette movement in the early 1920s. To conclude, we have now definitely surveyed the entire history of Indian migration and seen the interpolations of gender, race and class in these communities in the early phase as well as in the later phases. The attempts of the Indians in the middle of this phase, that is in the second phase where in the post-colonial period they tried to adapt to their new homeland by integrating and assimilating, transformed itself to a different kind of situation in the post 1980s scenario because of globalization and multiculturalism. Due to trade contacts, the Indian governments entered into very nice relationships with the governments abroad and therefore, the host countries were kind of compelled to accept and therefore, adopt multicultural policies towards these immigrant populations. 
the success and the failure of the Indian communities can be measured differentially in the different countries, but by and large Indian communities are extremely successful in terms of economics, though socially they remain a little aloof politically in very sporadic terms they are found to be very active, but mostly they are insular especially they do not like to participate in marriage and other social relationships with the hostlands. These are some of the genuine problems that are faced by Indians in terms of race and marginalization in the diaspora societies. However, the Indian community has always been a very, very strong multicultural community itself back home. Therefore, some of these multicultural practices are carried forward into the new hostland and Indian exoticism and culture is very much celebrated in these new places. With increasing migration, the new and emerging trends of multiculturalism change, Indians are acquiring different kinds of habits and they are becoming more and more insular and they are participating in what is called holding a kind of a non-identity for themselves. It remains to be seen what kind of shape new immigrations and new waves of migration and settlement in new countries will take in the say 22nd century or the future. No one is quite sure about what is going to happen, but one hopes that the Indian communities abroad will stay peaceful and successful and work towards the progress of both host nations and their homelands.